thank you as always, Praise Team. You do a fantastic job every week. Dennis mentioned earlier during the announcements, he mentioned the silent auction stuff. If you were the winning bid on any of that silent auction stuff, you should have gotten a text or a note or somehow from Kayla to let you know that. And all that stuff's available downstairs in the fellowship hall. But I just want to mention we had a big barbecue at our house yesterday, and it was a great time of fellowship. And if you weren't able to make it, we missed you there, and we hope you can make it to the next fellowship, which will be uh, the third week in September. We're having a PJ and movie night, and so we hope that you can make it to that. But we, we try to have those just so we can have time to connect as a church family. I was sharing with someone during the, the greeting time that names don't stick the way they used to stick. I mean, you may, you may have that same experience, but we have those times so we can get to, get to connect and get to know each other a little bit better, so I hope you can make it to that one in September. The other thing I want to mention about the silent auction is you remember we, we did that for a purpose, and that was to raise money for the foster homes that the, the Baptist Church in Crihana Vecchia, Moldova are building for orphans in that village, lots of orphans, and so they're building these foster homes. They had the materials, they had the workers, but they needed some extra money to be able to feed the workers through the end of the project. And we had already sent them between our church and a couple of other local churches. We had sent them about 2,000 euro already. They needed somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 total for the, to get them through the entire project. That silent auction raised almost 1,700 euros. So praise God for what he did. Right, yeah, absolutely, praise God. Um, that brings them right into the window of what they needed to complete that project. So I sent the pastor a note this morning to let him know that he hasn't seen it yet, but um, I, I just imagine what his response is going to be. So that's just wonderful. And praise God for his people as you responded and gave generously to that. So what a wonderful opportunity for us to be a part. Well, today we're coming to the end of the apologetic series, Got Questions. Remember, we've been looking at these, these questions throughout the, the month of August, these apologetics topics. And I noticed as I was looking over my notes last night, I, I did a typo. Instead of got questions, I typed in God questions. But it's the same thing. It's the same, even if that was the name of the series. But, but I do pray that as we've looked at these issues, what is the word of God? Can, what is the question, what's the deal with evil and suffering? Who is Jesus? And then this, the question we've come through this morning, do all roads lead to heaven? I, I hope and pray that, that this series has been valuable for you not just in strengthening your own faith to be able to solidify what you believe and why you believe it, but because we encounter people who have these very questions, maybe friends, maybe coworkers, maybe family members, maybe unbelievers, and maybe even some believers that, that struggle with these very issues. And so I pray um, these sermons and these, uh, this series has been helpful for you. And as I mentioned this morning, we come to maybe the granddaddy of all of those questions, the one that we probably will encounter maybe more than any other question, and that is, do all roads lead to heaven? And this is, this is one of those, those questions that as we look at it, I want to address several aspects of it. And I realized as, we, as I, we're going through the message in the first service, I realized this is a bit like drinking from a fire hose this morning. So I will try to give it to you in Dixie cup you know, so you can drink it as we go. But it's a lot of information for us to talk about because I want to address several aspects of this question. I want us to look at this. Why should we believe there is only one road? If we're going to cling to that as believers, and we absolutely ought to, this is a foundational um, testimony of the Christian faith, but why should we believe there is only one road? Why couldn't there be many roads? Right? That's really one of the questions that we get. Do all roads lead to heaven? Why couldn't there be many roads that God would offer for us to get to heaven? I want us to look at that question. What about those who have never heard the gospel? That's sort of the offshoot of question number two. But what about those who have never heard the gospel? And then, as we have with all of these, I want us to spend just a few moments and say, okay, now what? What are we to do with all of this information that we're learning? Now, that's a full menu of stuff, I, I will readily admit. So I'm going to ask you to join me in John chapter 14, and let's just jump right into it, uh, into the message here, and, and look at these four questions. We, we come to the first question, and why should we believe there is only one road? And as you're flipping there to John chapter 14, Instantly, if you spend any amount of time in an evangelical church, you think of John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's a very clear statement on the part of Christ. But I think what we also see is in the first six verses of John chapter 14, over and over through that passage, Jesus makes this, this claim of one road. There are not many roads. There is only one. And so I'm going to read the whole first six verses of John 14, and I want to pick them apart just a little bit 
So we can see throughout this passage how he teaches why should we believe there is only one road. Start there at verse number one. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, and if that were not so, I would, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how, how do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And as I mentioned, I think when we think about that passage, we, we instantly jump to verse number 6, and that is a clear, unambiguous claim on the part of Christ that there are not many roads, there is only one. But throughout that passage, he makes that point. Verse number 1, he makes this clear connection to say, if you believe in God, then the logical choice is to believe in me. And we looked at last week how Jesus made this powerful claim to be the Messiah, the Son of God, God in the flesh, and here he claims it again. There's a natural connection. If we're going to believe in God, the natural connection then is to believe in Christ. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. There's a natural connection between those two. And then in verses 2 and 3, there's a phrase that sticks out to me in verses 2 and 3, and that's this, the phrase where he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. And that verse just stands out to me. Every time I read that passage, that's the verse that sticks out in verses 2 and 3. And, and here's what Jesus is saying there. He's saying, listen, if I don't tell you these things, if I don't tell you what God is like, if I don't tell you what heaven is like, if I don't tell you about the road to get to heaven and how you can get there, if I don't tell you these things, there is no other way you will find them out. That's what he's saying. If these things were not true, I would have told you that. And as he speaks, notice, he doesn't speak like he's a, an infrequent visitor to heaven. He doesn't speak like that's the summer home or something like that. Like he go, just goes there periodically. He speaks with authority, like he's a native. This is his hometown he's telling you about. He and he alone knows what this place is like. And if, it were, if these things were not true, I would tell you that because you're not going to find it out anywhere else. That's the message there in verses 2 and, two and 3. And then in verse 3, he takes it one step further. And he says, and I and I alone have the sole authority to decide who goes there with me. Listen again to what he says in verse 3. He says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. A very clear claim. There's not someone else that's going to come and make this decision. There's not someone else that's going to provide a way for you to be there in heaven. I have to be the one. I am the only one who can do that. And then jump on down to that most familiar verse in verse number 6. And notice the way he presents that argument. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you are a grammar nerd, I say that affectionately because I was a grammar nerd, at least in my early years of high school. I loved grammar. I realize I am probably maybe the only one in this room and maybe the only one on the planet that actually enjoyed grammar, but I did. But if you're a grammar nerd, you realize that the word the is what they call a definite article. I saw the glazed look go across all of your eyes as soon as I said grammar and definite article. You immediately flashed back to junior high and your English teacher and all of you glazed over. Here's what a children's grammar book said about the difference between a definite article and an indefinite article. So even, you know, our, even our kids' minds can grab a hold of this. This is what it said. The difference between those two, those two is this. It's the difference between talking about a specific cookie or any cookie at all. And Jesus uses the definite article. I am the way, the truth, the life. He's not talking about any way. He's not talking about any old truth. He's not talking about any old kind of life. The, very specific, one way. And he says, I am the way. There is not any old way. There is just one. That's the claim he is making. He says, I am the truth. And we're going to look at this here in just a minute, this sort of modern idea about truth, that there can be your truth and my truth. Maybe you've heard that statement made. That's just not my truth. And Jesus said, this is not a question of your truth or my truth. I am the truth. 
You want to know what truth is? Here it is. I'm standing right in front of you, he says, and I am the life. And the word life that he uses there, it means supernatural, eternal life. That's what he's talking about. And he said, if you want to find this kind of life, eternal, supernatural life, I am it. I am the one place where this is possible. I am the only way to experience that. He makes a, a very positive, exclusive claim about how it is that we can get to heaven, that there is only one road, there is only one truth, there is only one life. Now, if that were the only passage, or these were the only verses that taught this, I mean, one might be tempted to say this. Well, listen, can you really build such a significant theology, such a significant belief system from just these few passages of Scripture? Well, I am of the mindset that if God saw to it to reveal something to be said in his word one time, that certainly is enough for us to grab a hold of it, for us to believe it, for us to be impact, that to be impactful for our lives if God says it just once. And, and he makes a pretty compelling case, I think, through these verses. That can we, could we build an entire belief system off this one passage? Yes, I believe we could. But that's not the only place. And I'm going to ask you to jot these down. On the inside flap of your bulletin, there's the visitor slip, and on the back side of that, it says sermon notes. I'm going to ask you to jot down some of these verse references. Other places, the New Testament teaches this same idea of one road, one exclusive way to get to heaven. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And I think what Peter is saying there in a very clear way to say, listen, if Jesus is not the only way, he's not a way at all. And, if, and based on Jesus' claim, if he is not the way, there is no way. And Peter's making a, backing up Jesus' claim there, Acts 4.12. 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the, the man Jesus Christ, a pretty clear message that Paul paints there. 1 John 5.12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. John couldn't be any more explicit about what he's, the point he's making. And then John 3.18, if you spent any time in children's Sunday school or Awana or VBS, you have learned John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. That whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. My kids all came up in Awana. You, you, know, you learn those verses very quickly. By the way, cheap plug for Awana. If you haven't signed your kids up for Awana yet, sign your kids up for Awana. You read down two more verses, though. John 3, 18. This is what John said just two verses later. Whoever believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And verse after verse after verse, and I'll give you some more to write down here in just a minute. The unambiguous, clear testimony of the New Testament, one way, one way, one way. If God said it once, it's certainly something we can apply to our lives. How much more so when we see how many times God has laid this, this truth out in the New Testament that there is only one way salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Dr. Adrian Rogers said this. Dr. Rogers is one of my absolute favorite 20th century preachers, and he's gone on to be with the Lord now several years ago, but this is what he said about this passage, John 14:6. Or all these for that matter. He said, if the Apostle John or Peter or Paul, those were the collective authors of all of those, if the Apostle John or Peter or Paul publicly proclaim a lie, well, that's bad enough. But if Jesus Christ, who claims to be the Messiah, is a liar, then not only is he not the disciple's Savior, he's not your Savior and he's not mine, because a liar is nobody's Savior. And here we see, based on the, the very word of Christ himself, that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And there are other verses I mentioned. I'll give you a couple more. So jot these down. If, you, if you've got that little slip there, jot these down. I'm not going to read all of them, but just so you can go back and look at them later. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. You see a pattern there in the book of Acts. As God is establishing his church, he's making this very plain testimony about the exclusivity of faith in Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, part of the Great Commission. We often think about that in a missionary aspect, but it's a very evangelical uh, claim of uh, the exclusive way of Christ to salvation. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 28. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Over and over 
and over again. As we read through the New Testament, there is no question that the, the claims of the New Testament are very clear and unambiguous that salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ and no other way. There is only one road. So we ask the question, why should we believe there is only one road? Because of the overwhelming testimony of the New Testament, that's why we should believe that. But then I think that leads to the second question. Maybe the question that people often ask us, or one of them anyway, is why couldn't there be many roads? But what if I don't necessarily want to believe the truth of the New Testament? Couldn't there be many roads? Wouldn't God allow me to pick a different road? Couldn't there be another way to heaven for someone who maybe doesn't even want to believe the truth of the Bible? And at the very core of that objection, first of all, is a pushback against biblical authority. You say, I don't want to believe what the Bible says about how I can go to heaven. I want to be the authority. I want to choose a different road. Maybe God revealed that, but that's not the one I want. And there's a clear pushback against biblical authority, but also against the character of God himself. Now think about the charge that comes with that. Couldn't there be more than one road? Shouldn't there be more than one road? The charge there is that God is not fair. That God is not fair in providing only one road to heaven. God should provide more roads to heaven. That's really the, the challenge there, the charge of God's fairness. But I think it begs the question, how many would be fair? How many roads should God provide? How many roads does he need to provide to satisfy mankind's claim of fairness? What if God provided 10? Someone would come along and say, I think he ought to provide 11. What if he provided 20? Someone would come along and say, why not? 21, and that would be a never-ending thing, how many roads should God provide? And I think the response to the charge that God is not fair in providing one road to heaven, I think the response to that is you're absolutely right. Now, before you hit the gong and grab the big hook and drag me off the stage and take me out back and stone me with gravel for heresy in the back parking lot, follow me for just a minute. To the charge that God is not fair in providing one road, I would say that is an absolutely right assessment. The idea of fairness speaks of what we deserve, right? Now, many of you this week, staff sergeant results just came out this week, and I saw on Facebook that many people made staff sergeant this week, and if you're one of them, congratulations. You definitely earned that promotion. And why did you earn it? Why do you deserve that promotion? Because you put in all the hard work to get the good eval ratings, right? You put in the time and the effort to study so that you could do well on the test. When those results came out, you deserved that promotion. That was fair that you should have been promoted. Fairness speaks of what we deserve. God's grace, on the other hand, by very nature, by very definition, God's grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. There is absolutely nothing fair in Christ coming to this earth. God taking on the form of the man and living among us, absolutely not fair. That Jesus should have lived the perfect life, but then was tried and convicted of things that he did not do, absolutely not fair. That he should die on the cross in your place and mine after, being suffered, after suffering and being tortured, absolutely not fair. There is nothing fair about the grace of God. But here's the thing. It's not some fairness we can say, God, you're not right. That fairness is in our favor. There is nothing fair about the grace of God. And we ask the question, how many roads should God provide? Zero. That's how, that would be fair. The absolute fair thing for God to do would be to allow us to live out the punishment for our sin, which is eternity separated from him. The fairness of this question is that it's fair. It's unfair in our favor. The grace of God leans it towards us. But then it's also a pushback, not only against the character of God, but it's also a pushback, I think, against the nature of truth itself. I want to mention a couple of resources um, as, we, as we go through this argument. We talk about this nature of truth. This is one of the common sort of uh, arguments or discussions you'll hear today, this idea of your truth and my truth. I mentioned that a little bit ago. This idea that truth is relative, and what, what is true is really only what I believe to be true. My opinion is what determines whether something is true or not. And to, to deal with this issue, John MacArthur wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Truth War. And so if you want to look a little more into this issue, I encourage you to get a hold of this book and read through it. It's not a hard read. But John MacArthur's The Truth War, he really does deal with this issue of 
your truth and my truth? And can we believe that there are some things that are objectively true and how those relate to our faith? But that's really the, the issue here. Can I believe there are things that are objectively true or is all truth subjective? Truth is determined by my opinion. And if I, in my opinion, I don't like the word of God, if in my opinion, I don't think the word of God is authoritative, then that's all that really matters. My opinion is what determines truth. Well, someone once said this about opinions. Opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got them, and most of them stink. And when it comes to this issue, this question, I'm going to determine the validity of the roads to heaven by my opinion. That really is the case with that line of thinking. Let me put it to you this way. If you and I climbed up on the roof of this building, and we came up right to the edge of the roof, and I said, let's jump off. Now, immediately, if you know me at all, you know the ridiculousness of this illustration because I'm afraid of heights, so I wouldn't have climbed up on the roof of the, this building in the first place. But nonetheless, we climb up on the roof, we come to the edge, and I say, let's jump off. Now, you would wisely say, I'm not going to do that because, you know, there's this thing called gravity, and it's going to pull me down, and I'm going to splat on that sidewalk below, so I'm not jumping off the roof. But what if I said to you, you know what? Gravity schmavity. That's your truth. That's not my truth. I don't accept the truth of gravity. I don't believe in the truth of gravity. I don't even like the truth of gravity. That's not my truth. I'm jumping off. And I jump off the roof, and I can chant all the way down, not my truth, not my truth, not my truth. But you know what? The fact that it's not my truth is not going to slow my rate of descent at all. And the fact that it's not my truth is not going to cushion my fall one single bit. And my opinion concerning the truth is not going to change the objective reality of it one single bit. And when we come to the truths of, of who God is, this is where the many roads argument, I think, falls apart. The author of this other book I want to mention to you called Is Jesus the Only Savior? And he goes through these arguments that we're making in a lot more detail than I am this morning by Ronald Nash, Is Jesus the Only Savior? But he makes this quote in, uh, in that book. He says this, he says, it simply will not do to downplay, ignore, or minimize the differences between world religions. They are logically incompatible on critical issues such as the nature of God, the nature of the human predicament, and the nature of salvation. And whether, what, regardless of what your opinion is, there is either one eternal, transcendent, powerful God, or there is not. That's an objective reality. Man is either born a sinner or he is not. That's an objective truth. We either are saved by our works or we are not. That's an objective reality. There is either one road to heaven or there are many roads. That's an objective reality. Now, you may have an opinion about those matters, and you probably do. And the people you interact with may have opinions about those. But either they are true or not, and our opinion about them doesn't affect the reality. It doesn't change the truth about those matters. You say, okay, but you still haven't answered the question why I should believe this, what this presents as truth. I think you think back over this series. And the things that we have uncovered and the things that we have talked about throughout the, the course of these last several weeks in this series. We started three weeks ago with the, the nature of God's word. And I think we laid out a pretty compelling case there that the Bible is the authoritative, infallible, inerrant word of God, spoken from the very heart and breath of God himself. And we looked at the presence of evil and suffering and said that doesn't diminish the God that is revealed in the Bible, not one single bit. In fact, the existence of those things in this world really points us more definitively to who God is as, as cre uh, presented in the Bible. And then we looked last week at the, the life and the, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His claim that he is the Messiah, God in the flesh, and how all of those things, him fulfilling all of those prophecies, make it mathematically impossible that he was not who he said he was. Now, again, we come to this claim in John 14. Why should we believe this version, this presentation of the truth? Because this is the word of God. He is the Messiah, God in the flesh that has come here. And if he's, he is the only one that will know these matters, this is why we should believe that. Why couldn't there be many roads? Because it's logically incompatible. 
for all roads to lead to heaven. The charge of God is, is completely contrary to God's grace that there should be multiple roads to heaven. And it simply doesn't make any sense that there should be more than one road. But what about those who have never heard about Jesus? That's maybe the subset of that second question. What about those who have never heard about Christ? And this question is asked by skeptics. Certainly people who want to challenge the Christian faith will ask this question. It's asked by opponents of Christianity. But I think it's also asked sometimes by believers who hear that question asked and they say, yeah, maybe that's a valid question to think about. What about those who have never heard about Jesus? Well, to address that just in a very brief sense, again, we can't address everything we'd like to this morning, but I'm going to ask you to flip over with me to Romans chapter 1. You don't have to keep your finger in John 14. We won't be going back there. Romans chapter 1. Now, I'm going to focus in on verses 18 through 20 of Romans chapter 1 as we look at this question and say, what about that one who has never heard of Jesus? Would, would God be correct in sentencing that one to hell? Is that a right thing for God to do? And has God done enough to help that person realize they're standing before him? Now, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but let me kind of catch up a little bit. Very quickly, Paul makes a, an argument here from creation. And he comes to this conclusion, that what we see around us and what we see in the created order reveals enough about God for us to be rendered guilty before him. He says that man is without excuse. What we see around us and what we understand about God through what we see has revealed enough about God that he is absolutely right and just in sentencing one to hell who does not come to faith in Christ, in faith in Jesus Christ. And so I want us to look at that, starting, what, is, what do we learn about God from creation? Look again at verse 20. We'll look at verse 20. We haven't looked at it yet. Look at verse 20 of Romans chapter 1. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. What has been clearly seen about God through what we see around us in nature. Well, first thing he says, we learn about God's eternal power. Now, this question, what about the one who has never heard about Jesus, is always, always, al almost always painted in this hypothetical situation. What about the native who lives in a hut in the middle of the desert and has never heard the name of Jesus? Would God be right in sending that one to hell? Well, even the native who lives in the hut in the middle of the desert realizes that everything he sees has a creator. He maybe lives in a hut. That's part of the, the challenge that comes to us. He realizes the hut didn't make, make itself. Someone had to create the hut. Now, probably he did, but still, someone had to create the hut. And the one who created the hut is different. They're not part of the hut. They're apart from that. They're, they're, they're more powerful. They're stronger. They're smarter than the hut. He realizes it didn't create itself. And maybe his loincloth that he wears, he realizes that didn't create itself. Someone had to make that. And as he looks around at everything he sees, he sees a tree in his village. He said, I didn't make the tree. I don't know anybody in my village who made the tree. Collectively, if we put all our talent together, we couldn't have done that. And even the, the hypothetical a native who lives in the hut in the middle of the desert realizes that everything he sees has a creator. And he can come to realize that, well, gosh, if everything I see in my village has a creator, then everything I see must have a creator. He comes to learn about God's eternal power. And he comes to learn that God is, in fact, powerful. Now, he doesn't know anything about physics. He doesn't know anything about geology. But maybe he sees a, a volcano that erupts. And he says, I can't do that. All of the people in my village can't do that. We can't create something that powerful. Maybe he feels an earthquake under his feet. He said, you know what? If all of us jumped up and down at the same time, we couldn't make that happen. He just sees a simple thunderstorm, and he says, I can't do that. And as he looks around and interacts with the things that he sees, he said, man, somebody had to create all of this, and that somebody had to be more powerful than that volcano. He had to be more powerful than this earthquake. He had to be more powerful than that thunderstorm. The one who created all of this had to be eternal, and he had to be powerful. Now, he may not put it in those terms, but that's what he comes to realize 
about who God is. And that's why Paul says in verse 19, he says, that which is known about God is evident, for God made it evident to them. When we look around creation, he goes one step further in verse 18 and says, for us to deny all of this, we have to actively suppress it. This is logical to us. Our brains scream out that that is true. There is an eternal creator, and he is powerful, way more powerful than us. But Paul also says that God's divine nature is revealed in all of creation. That guy in the hut, in the desert, he comes to learn about who God is. He looks around at that tree that's in the village, and he says, hey, that tree produces stuff little green balls or little red balls or something, and I pull those things off and I can eat them. And, and then there's this water that comes down out of the sky, and, and I seem to crave that. And so then when I go and get it, boy, that seems to be something I really need for my body. And he sees that God is good. This creation, this thing that has been created by this one I don't yet know, it provides everything I need. Man, the one who made this must be good. And then he comes to realize, I think, that that God is perfect. Look at how all this stuff fits together. That water that comes down out of the sky, I need it. It seems like the plants need it because when they don't get it, they dry up and die. The animals that I'm so much different than, they need it as well. Look at how perfectly all this stuff fits together. This one who created it, he's good and he's perfect. He must be more perfect than this synergy he's created within nature. I think there's something else though that native learns about God just from looking around. He says that this God is eternal. He's powerful. He's good. He's perfect. But I'm not. I'm none of those things. I knew who I really am. I knew who I react, how I react with the other natives in my village. And I know I'm not like this God. This God is way out of my league. And the only way that I can relate to this God is if he provides the way for me to relate to him. Now, even the native who's living in the hut, all of this, I think, is evident. We have to suppress that truth to deny it. We have to, as Paul says in verse 25, we have to actively exchange the truth for a lie. This is evident within our hearts. Now, that's not enough to bring him to faith in Christ. What about that one who lives in the hut? What about that one who has never heard the name of Jesus? That, that is not enough to bring him to salvation, but it brings him close. It brings him awfully close to the point of saying, God, I know I can't relate to you unless you reveal yourself to me, unless you reach down and make the way. And to that one who is seeking, to that one who comes to that point, trying to understand who this God is. Now, I don't know how God's going to bring the truth of Jesus to that one. Maybe it'll be a missionary. He'll have him drop down with a parachute in the middle of that village, and he'll share Christ with him. Maybe it'll be a transworld radio uh, broadcast where he'll hear the gospel preached. Maybe he'll send you or me as a missionary to go share the truth with him. I don't know how God's going to do that, but here's what I do know. This is his promise in, in his word through the prophet Jeremiah. If you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. That one who is seeking who looks around creation and says, I've learned a great deal about who this God is, and I know I can't even begin to relate to him on my own. That one who is seeking, God will provide a way for that one to come to faith in Christ. Now, however, however that is, and however God chooses to handle that, this is what I know for sure, that whatever he does, it will be right, it will be just, and it will be proper, because that's who God is. What about that one who lives in a hut in the middle of nowhere and has never heard about Jesus? God has revealed enough about himself to bring them almost to the point of salvation. And if they are seeking to know him, he will provide the rest of the way. God will always be good. Now, what are we to do with all of this? I mentioned, I know that's a drinking from the fire hose experience this morning. What are we to do with all of this? Well, I think the answer is obvious. If you're an unbeliever here this morning, you have never repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? I think the answer is obvious. We'll do that. Repent of your sins and trust in Christ. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever trusted in Jesus. I don't know if I'm saved. Well, if someone asked me, do you know if you're married? I would say, yeah, I know that. I remember a time when I 
specifically stood there and made some vows, and Jeannie and I got married. Now, sometimes I might forget the date, and I'll pay for that later. Sometimes I may not always remember when that happened, but I remember that it happened. And I would say if there is a significant question in your mind, I don't know if I'm saved or not, maybe that's an indication that perhaps you're not. And if you're here this morning and you've never repented and trusted in Jesus, God's word is true. Jesus is the Messiah, and he is our only hope of salvation. Don't leave this place today without trusting in Christ as your Savior. But for the believer, there's stuff for us to do, how we can respond to these truths as well. Those friends, those family members, those coworkers and neighbors that come with these questions, they need to hear the truth. That is the only loving response, to speak the truth in love. Now, they may not always like what we have to say, but they absolutely need to know the most loving response we can give to them is to point out the lies of the all roads argument, where that argument falls apart and why that argument falls apart and bring them to the truth of God's word. To say God is absolutely gracious and merciful and loving and he has provided a way for us to be saved, that is awesome and amazing news and we need to share the truth. This is an important question. It's an important question that maybe you have wrestled with in your mind at some point in time. It's an important question that some people you will encounter are wrestling with. And as we come back to the truth of who Christ is and come back to the truth of God's word, we realize that God has revealed enough about himself to bring us to faith in Jesus Christ. And I pray that we are all responsive to that to be able to stand firm for the truth and to share the life-giving message of Christ and the hope of salvation he provides. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for the chance to open your word this morning. Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us. As we look around nature and we just realize what an amazing God you are, just from what we can see realize your eternity, your power, your goodness, your perfection. We realize that we're not any of those things. And then we open up your word and we realize there's this one named Jesus who came and claimed he was the Messiah, proved it through his life, and he makes this claim. If you want to go to heaven, you have to go through me. Father, if there is one here this morning who's never repented of their sins, never trusted in you, never experienced the, the forgiveness and hope that is available, Father, I pray that in these next few moments, Lord, you would just impact their hearts, that they would respond and even just come down to the front and say something as simple as, I need to know Jesus. Father, for your children in this room, sometimes we back away shy away from sharing the truth because it's going to make me unpopular. People are going to get mad at me. They're not going to like me anymore. They might be offended at what I have to say. And Father, if you're dealing in the hearts of your people today over that matter, I pray this would be a time of just restoration. And Father, however you move in these next few moments, Lord, I just pray you'd help us to be responsive as your spirit leads. And I pray in Jesus' name. Well, this is our time of invitation. Stand with us as we sing this, this final hymn. And if there's some decision you need to make this morning, maybe it's trusting in Christ or joining this church or just come to this altar and pray, as the Spirit leads in these next few moments, you respond during our hymn of invitation.